Hertz Radio Turin, 510, 1949. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is welcome and appreciated. There is not much about Hertz Radio Turin on the Internet. Only a few models are mentioned on radiomuseum.org. This restoration is about the model 510, not mentioned at all, but there is a 512 that is believed to be from 1949. Unfortunately, on radiomuseum.org, there is no reference to the source of the advert published there. The item under restoration arrived as an incomplete chassis. There were only two tubes out of five. The first IEF transformer was missing. There was no output transformer and no speaker. The variable capacitor was damaged and a few components were missing also under the chassis. For reference, this is a slow scan of the original condition under the chassis. By the way that the components appeared soldered and arranged, this unit must have been built as a kit. In fact, the original soldering job was done with great care, but without wrapping the component terminals around the posts. There were also visible signs of later repairs. One of the filter capacitors was replaced, and the volume potentiometer seemed to be much more recent than the other components. This radio must have been kept for a long time in a wet environment, where the rust took control of every iron part. So it was necessary to start dismantling the radio completely, to properly clean the chassis and the other metal components. While doing it, the original schematic diagram was written down and checked multiple times. The iron parts were then put together in a proper container and submerged in water and muriatic acid. It was the same liquid already used for a previous project that was kept because it was still effective. Please bear in mind that the muriatic acid solution, even if very diluted, should be kept outdoors because in a contained space, the vapors would attack every iron part around, developing rust on them. After a couple of days, the pieces were cleaned from the last residues of paint and washed from the acid. After extracting the pieces from the rinsing bath, they were immediately dried and sprayed with zinc paint to prevent further development of rust. Where appropriate, another layer of paint was sprayed later with a more suitable color. At the time of this radio, there was in Italy an important internal market for radio components, many of which were more or less compatible with Geloso production. Here is an example of some adverts contained in the magazine Lintena of January 1949. One could find empty chassis RF modules, dial mechanisms, dial scales, IF transformers, and so on. Even unbranded radio cabinets were available. It was very much like in the 1990s, when it was common practice to buy the components for assembling a personal computer. Even though this radio was branded, it was using components similar or almost identical to Gelosa ones. The RF module of this radio is branded Delta, but it is clearly an almost identical replica of the Gelosa module 1903, which evolved from the model 1901. 
described in the Geloso Technical Bulletin 2829, Summer and Fall 1938. The differences are mostly on the sequence used for the trimmer capacitors. It is reasonable to assume that also the Delta RF module was made for the IF frequency of 467 kilohertz and that it should have covered the medium wave band between 580 and 190 meters and the short wave band between 52 and 16 meters. The Delta RF module was filthy, therefore it was cleaned very carefully, paying attention to the very delicate coils. An attempt was made to straighten the bench shaft, but it broke, and later it was necessary to make an extension. The mica capacitors used in the RF module were not sealed, which makes them vulnerable to dirt and to detergents. Therefore, they have been replaced with surface mount and P0 equivalents, installed using very small boards. However, later some values were changed, but that is explained in a separate section. The Geloso RF modules 1901, 1902, and 1903 were meant to be used with a double variable capacitor with a full capacity of 465 plus 465 picofarads. This is a genuine Geloso variable capacitor 822, corresponding to the required specifications. One should notice the bearings carefully suspended by spheres. The corresponding component found on the radio was very similar to the Geloso Model 822, but with cheaper bearings. Unfortunately, it was damaged and it was necessary to fix the rotor blades. Luckily, the structure is easily dismantled and rebuilt which also allowed the careful cleaning of the parts and a proper treatment of the iron skeleton against rust. Here it is visible that some cotton was used to protect the holes that should not be covered with lacquer. The following clips show the rebuilding process of the variable capacitor starting from the removal of the masking cotton. The screws were carefully kept aside and cleaned from rust. The original rotten soft washers were replaced with nylon equivalents.
The rotor shaft was still loose, and the bush at the front needed to be adjusted. On the chassis of this radio, the first IEF transformer was missing. Very likely it was used to repair another radio a long time ago. This was an occasion for trying to reproduce a working IEF transformer without taking it from another chassis. The plan was to use two fixed inductors with two trimmer capacitors. The holes on the IEF can were insulated with grommets to avoid shorts because the trimmer capacitor of the primary winding would be exposed to be plus. The hole in the middle was meant to allow the adjustment of the distance between the two inductors. When the prototype of the IEF transformer was ready, the rebuilt of the radio front end could start. The plan was to use a DC high voltage power supply to provide some B+, a common bench power supply for the filament voltage, and to complete the construction only up to the detection stage. But for now, only using Schottky diodes. With the help of a signal tracer, it was already possible to get an idea of the reception. Unfortunately, there was a mistake that was spotted only much later. The capacitor C14 was inadvertently installed with a value of about 50 nanofarads instead of picofarads, which is the reason for so much bass in the audio of this clip. <laughs> At the time of the early test appearing in the previous section, the radio had already the AGC working, which was used to align the IF transformers using an oscilloscope. A non-modulated signal of 467 kilohertz was injected to the first grid of the converter tube while the AGC voltage was read across R14. Here is the oscilloscope used as a DC voltmeter, doing the alignment, seeking for the most negative value. Then, the signal generator was set to sweep between 462 and 472 kilohertz, and the oscilloscope showed a very narrow bandwidth of the IF chain. It seemed that the only cause of the bad reception obtained in the initial test was 
was this particular behavior of the first IF transformer, but, as already mentioned, the excessive base was mainly the result of a wrong value in the capacitor C14 instead. Unfortunately, at this point, the early prototype of the first IF transformer was judged completely inadequate and dismantled, which means that it was not possible to test it again when the mistake was found. Anyhow, the bandwidth was so narrow because the inductors were too distant from each other. However, experimenting shorter distances, there were parasitic oscillations that disappeared only keeping the inductors distant. For making another prototype of IF transformer, two variable inductors were used from a collection of random coils bought online, probably recovered from an old television set. Like for the first prototype, small perforated boards were used cutting them at the right sizes. Only the two coils were installed on the board while the capacitors were later connected from under the chassis because the actual value had to be experimented in circuit. Here is the result of the IF alignment with the new IF prototype, sweeping between 462 and 472 kilohertz. The reconstruction of the chassis started from the front end section, leaving the power supply area for later, using initially external power supplies for the B+, and the filament voltage. Nevertheless, the small board that was contained in the original arrangement had to be rebuilt and installed before being able to do an initial test. For the initial tests, the audio section was not installed. Therefore, the current flowing through the resistor R5 or 6 was much lower and the initial value for that resistor had to be significantly high to get the expected voltage drop of about 3 volts. When it was time to build also the power supply section, a small box was added for installing two fuses and three halogen light bulbs with the function of dropping some voltage from the mains considering that the power transformer was made for maximum 220 volts AC. Moreover, the other taps at the primary winding of the power transformer were insulated to avoid damaging the radio with a wrong input voltage selection. In Italy, at the time in which this radio was built, the dial arrangement was fairly standardized. This advert was published in the magazine Lantenna, edition July 1951. Typically, the variable capacitor drum was very large, with some elastic material connecting to the bush in the middle to reduce the stress on the variable capacitor shaft. The variable capacitor drum of this unit lost this stuff because it was rotten, and it was fabricated using folded paper, glued with vinylic glue. Then the dial panel was rebuilt, installing the pulleys and the flywheel. Then some stainless steel cord was used, as a replacement for the original iron cord that was severely deteriorated. However, the flywheel has a very thin internal shaft, too thin for the new steel cord, which broke very soon. Therefore, the flywheel thin internal shaft was slightly enlarged, wrapping some wire held in place by heat shrink pipe and super glue. Then, instead of using a steel dial cord, 
Some thick fishing wire was used, this time without the need for a spring to keep it in tension, because it is elastic enough to be used without it. Only after the dial front panel is fully stringed, it can be installed in front of the chassis, inserting the shaft of the variable capacitor into its drum. While doing it, one should be very careful to avoid letting the dial cord become loose, disengaging from the pulleys or the drum. The small banner that shows the selected band through a hole on the dial front panel is hooked to a small drum connected to the band switch selector and it is pulled by a spring attached to the dial front panel. It is generally impossible to achieve a proper alignment of this style of RF module without changing also some values of the fixed capacitors and adding some more capacitors alongside the trimmers already available. For this reason, it is necessary to be able to read the frequency generated by the local oscillator without interfering or influencing the circuit. For the purpose would be needed a very sensitive digital oscilloscope. However, if the desired sensitivity is not available, some tools could be prepared like it was done for this restoration. A coil with a few turns was connected to an antenna preamplifier, and its output was read by a small frequency counter. One should consider that if the input signal is too strong the output would contain harmonics and the frequency counter would report a frequency that is much higher than it should be. In other words, the lower frequency readable is usually the correct one. The alignment procedure for this style of RF module was meant to develop as follows, keeping in mind that the location of the trimmer capacitors was different depending on the brand. For the medium wave band, the first trimmer is used to align the oscillator when the dial pointer is set to 210 meters. The fourth trimmer is used to align the antenna input to get the maximum signal with the dial set again to 210 meters. The third trimmer, padding, is used to align the oscillator when the dial is set to 520 meters. However, there is no padding for the antenna input. Therefore, when the oscillator is padded with the third trimmer, one should also find the better reception around 520 meters on the dial scale, adjusting the padding correspondingly, and correcting the position of the dial pointer on the dial cord so that it corresponds to the expected 520 meters. Obviously, the process should be repeated until no more adjustments are needed. In a similar way should proceeds the short wave band alignment with the exception that a correction or padding trimmer is not available. The item under restoration did not have a dial scale anymore. Therefore the only concern was to align the RF module in a way to get a reasonable tracking between the oscillator and antenna sections. However, even that was not very easy, and it was necessary to modify the value of a few fixed capacitors. These tables show the attempts made for the medium wave and short wave bands. It should be noticed that on the short wave band, it has been impossible to get a linear tracking between antenna and oscillator section, which obliged to accept a result that would give at least some reception at the cost of having one-third of the band completely deaf and plenty of image frequencies. To populate these tables, a function generator was used, set to the chosen frequency for the antenna input, injecting the signal into the antenna input, tuning the radio to the same frequency,
to activating the oscillator by shorting the variable capacitor in the oscillator section, seeking the maximum signal at the plate of the converter tube. Then the oscillator was reactivated, removing the short, and the oscillator frequency was read, using the tools described in the previous section. For example, the function generator is set here for 7 MHz. This is a very cheap model, and this high frequency is obtained only with the sweep function. The output of the function generator is connected to the antenna input through a dummy antenna. The oscillator section of the variable capacitor is shorted to ground to deactivate the oscillator. The oscilloscope probe is connected to the plate of the converter tube pin 3 using a decoupling capacitor. The variable capacitor is turned, looking for obtaining the maximum signal out of the plate of the converter tube. Then, the short at the oscillator section of the variable capacitor is removed, and the signal from the function generator is turned off to avoid false readings. The frequency of the local oscillator is read carefully, trying to identify the correct reading moving the sensor closer or farther from the oscillator coils. The lower stable frequency represents the correct reading. A way to evaluate the ability to receive is to inject at the antenna input a sweeping signal reading the AGC voltage with the oscilloscope while the variable capacitor is slowly turned. This is the short wave band after the final configuration of the RF module. As already predicted, there are deaf areas and image frequencies. There is no documentation about this radio model. Therefore, it was necessary to draw carefully the schematic diagram starting from the map of components under the chassis. The task was even more difficult because some components were just missing. This is the reason for some dotted lines in this drawing. Only two vacuum tubes arrived with the chassis and the others have been guessed but there is no guarantee that the original radio had the set of tubes that was chosen during the restoration. Here is the final schematic diagram with all the amendments applied to this particular restoration. As usual, the written documentation that accompanies these videos has better detailed pictures of these diagrams. One last look under the chassis. The unit under restoration arrived as an incomplete chassis, therefore, a cabinet was also designed and built. Not having a wood shop, it was built using wood cut from the DIY store, starting from a pine wood board, measuring 2,000 by 300 by 18 millimeters.
The precise measurements of the wood pieces are available in the written documentation that comes along with this video. The pieces that are important for the structure were joined using glue first, and later also inserting screws. Before completing the construction, it was checked that the chassis could fit perfectly as planned. The pieces in the middle of the front panel have a gap that was left intentionally because they are meant to be wrapped with fabric. They are not glued because they must be removable. The loudspeaker needed its own removable board to host also the final audio transformer and the resistor that was put in place of the field coil. The halogen light bulb has the function of limiting the B-plus current in case of shorts. At this point, the cabinet was stained and sprayed with clear lacquer. Then, a sheet of acrylic glass was installed. Then, it was the turn of the loudspeaker. Two nuts were soldered on two large washers to hold the chassis at the bottom of the cabinet. However, later a sheet of aluminum was added for shielding the surface. While the cabinet was built from scratch, it seemed appropriate also to try and make the knobs out of wood. The shafts sticking out of the wood of the cabinet are very short, 
therefore the new knobs need to have the set screw very close to the end. For this reason the internal rings, or bushes, of other partly broken knobs were taken. These rings were then fixed in the new wooden knobs using super glue. The original set screws were replaced with new stainless steel ones. After the knob leads were glued, the new knobs were sanded to make them smoother, then they were stained and finally sprayed with clear lacquer. The dial of this type of chassis was made for a glass with a transparent scale on it, like many other radios. For this project the dial scale was printed on paper and attached to the dial panel, behind the dial pointer. It was first written the position of the tuned frequencies according only to the antenna tuning. For consistency, knowing that the actual reception would be different due to the difficult alignment of the RF module. With the help of a vector graphic editor, an equivalent dial scale was written down and later printed. There was a mistake in the serial number copied on the new dial scale which was corrected later with a pen. Before COVID-19 I used to walk along the beach, off-season, observing the strange things that the sea laid on the sand and collecting some of the trash. One day I found a tube, still intact, that was before resuming this hobby, when I had no plan about it. However, I collected and saved the tube. The tube remained in the sea water for quite some time, and there were no marks on the glass or the base. However, later it was clear that it was a final audio amplifier, precisely a 6V6. The tube tested well, and I wanted to use it on this restoration project, but in circuit it was shorting, very likely due to residues that were accumulated inside the base. So, it was necessary to remove the base and clean that space. However, the initial attempts to disolder the pins failed. Moreover, the base was glued very well to the glass, and it was necessary to cut it, obviously, with great care for not damaging the glass. After cutting the bottom of the base, 
there remained the problem of disoldering the pins, which had to be done one by one. When the pins were all separated from the connections of the tube, before doing anything else, it was necessary to make a map, using as a reference the evacuation pipe in the middle. And here is the reason for the shorts. Sand and other residues filled the space inside the base. The removal of the upper part of the base required some more attention. It was then possible to clean the tube properly. Then some extensions were prepared making pigtail joints using relatively thin copper wire. All the wires were insulated using heat shrink pipes of different colors. The extended wires could then be inserted inside the pins of the new base, which was recovered from a previously broken tube. Before gluing the glass to the base, the tube was tested with a very satisfactory result. Because there was a significant gap between the glass and the base, some gel superglue was used.
Later the tube was tested again and everything was fine. Here are the parts that have been replaced. As usual, they will be kept until a different decision about them will be made. Here is the Hertz Radio Turin 510. The test is done in the early evening using an indoor loop antenna starting from the medium wave band. Short wave band. Les images de la nuit dernière vous témoignent une fois de plus. Le site est tout. Je vais vous dire que c'est un peu plus de temps. Je vais vous dire que c'est un peu plus de temps. Je vais vous dire que c'est un peu plus de temps. Je vais vous dire que c'est un peu plus de temps. Je vais vous dire que c'est un peu pl
have a lot of plot to improve. Gracias, Gerardo. 